Hello, I'm Tim Gary with QT2, and we are doing an Ironman 70.3 Western Mass course preview uh, with tips and other useful hints uh, to get you well on your way to the first ever race in Springfield, Massachusetts, and the surrounding areas. Um, the presentation overview, um, the QT2 system, five cornerstones, the final weeks of uh, prepping for the race, which we're in right now, uh, we have a couple weeks left uh, for this year's Western Mass 70.3. We have pre-race and check-in logistics uh, the day before uh, and race morning. Uh, course previews, which I'm really going to dive into a little bit here. Uh, more so, uh, the rest of the stuff is going to be slideshow presented and things that you can ask questions, but I'm really going to try to really dive into the course preview. Uh, and then race day pacing and fueling plans. Uh, the QT2 system, five cornerstones. Okay, we have training, which is, you know, your daily training, your training plans, uh, your restorative day-to-day -day nutrition. So what you're eating during the day, uh, building up to all your events. You have your fueling, which is your training fueling. So that's your hydration and your calories in when you're training. You have your pacing plan, whether it be heart rate based, power based, um, or rate of perceived exertion uh, for your pacing plan. And then also your mental fitness uh, attributes that are really, um, I think, overlooked uh, when it comes to a lot of these things. And those are part of the QT2 system, five cornerstones. Uh, and if you ever need any more detail about any of them and how they all interconnect, please feel free to reach out to us. The final weeks, the training, training plan, the tape, okay? Um, final key race-specific sessions, um, are super easy. Try to simulate race conditions and intensities during the training at, and train the course if you can. Um, the final weeks, train your race targets, your heart rate, your rate of perceived exertion, your pace and your power. And the final weeks, there are no fitness gains. Focus on frequency and feel. Do not overtrain or panic. Uh, if you, this is the one I always want, I want to emphasize this one part, overtrain or panic. Uh, as you get closer and you're getting into your final couple weeks, uh, what a lot of people do is they they think about the the workout that they missed, you know, a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, and then in the final week or two, they try to jam that workout back into their taper, and that's just really not conducive. So you know you have to let workouts go that that you missed uh, a while ago and focus on the taper and the fitness gains and the workouts that you did. Uh, err on the side of recovery. You know, less is more as you go into the last uh, 10 days, okay? Uh, and more important is to be rested than to, and be sharp, okay? Especially with the days off, take your days off. Don't, like I just said previously, try to add in extra workouts that you missed, thinking that that's going to make you better on race day. Um, believe it or not, the only thing you can generally do on race week is make yourself slower, not faster. So follow the plan, take your rest days, take it easy, follow the prescribed taper, and you'll be great. Uh, nutrition, okay, fluid intake, at least half of the body weight in addition to what you're doing during workouts. This is key, especially as the summer's starting to roll around. Uh, there's uh, in what Massachusetts right now, you know, we're starting to get some more heat. The temperatures are going up. So just make sure that you're up on your fluid intakes during the course of the day. Nutrient density food. So again, if you're working on your regular eating diet, make sure that you're, you're staying on that and you're not getting off kilter with your fruits and your veggies, okay? Your replenishment meals. Even prior to your long runs, high in carb, low in fat for a lot of different reasons, but just make sure that you're really focusing on your good nutrition plan. And again, in the final weeks, don't try anything new, okay? If you wanted to practice some eating before your long workouts, what you might have on race morning, those are things that you do weeks out or months out in advance, okay? Make sleep a priority. This is something that so many athletes overlook. We're so busy with our lives between work, maybe kids, family, um, all those things that go into it in our training, you know, that we're like, we skip some sleep to add in different parts. And especially in the taper week, uh, it's imperative that you're getting, you know, your eight hours of sleep a night in, in the heavy training as well. Please, you do need to make sleep a priority. That is one of your biggest restorative practices um, that you, you shouldn't take lightly. Uh, Anti-inflammatory measures, omega-3s, intake, hydration, reduce stress, sleep, 
you know, maybe lemon water, whatever you have to do for those anti-inflammatory things, stay away from things that, that are inflammatory, you know, your sugars and whatnot. Uh, taper down on your caffeine, uh, at target less than 800 milligrams a week. So that way, when you're in the race and you take that caffeine, it kind of gives you that little extra zip that you need maybe toward the end of your bike or the end of your run. Race week nutrition and restoration. Uh, eat relatively normal diet during race week, okay? Like I, I've said twice already, I'll probably say four or five more times. Uh, stay on what you know, okay? Don't get off track. Don't try new things. Don't try new foods or new supplements on the on, the, on race week. So eat normal. You're gonna eat some high high quality foods early on. And then as the race week goes on, you're gonna start to dwindle out some of those fiber foods so you don't have any GI issues uh, on race day, okay? Hydration is a focus, so you're drinking plenty of water like we've already talked about and or non or sports drinks, okay? Continue to taper down caffeine intake with none, of, with none on the day prior to the race day. That way, when you have it in those gels on race day, you really have a, a, a true impact of that caffeine in those gels that give you that little extra buzz that you need as you're getting tired. Uh, continue to make sleep the priority. You know, the night of the race, you know, a lot of people toss and turn. You're nervous. We're up early, you know, three, four a.m. to get ready for the race. So I always like to tell my athletes, you know, two days before is really the, you know, got to make sure you get that winning because the night of the race, you want to get to bed early, but often nerves cause you to toss and turn. So really make sure two, three days out, you're really dialed into that sleep. So if that night, the last night you kind of toss and turn, it's not nearly as bad. And try to stay off your feet. You know, when you go down to the expo, we'll talk about and do other things try to limit the amount of time on your feet. And that isn't just walking around and exercising. It's also standing around. So, you know, race week, take as much opportunity as you can to get off your feet, whether it be sitting or laying down. Fueling. In accordance with your plan um, and what you're looking to do, make sure that you're staying on track. You know, if you're coached by QT2, we have that all lined out. If you're coached by somebody else, you can ask us questions, but try to stay, <coughs> excuse me, Every session, stay on point. Use the products you plan to use on race day. Again, said it twice. I'll say it a few more times. Don't try anything new on race day. Okay, there are, I mean, in a jam, if you run out of fuel, you know, you can grab the stuff off course. But if you haven't tra trained with the stuff on course, that shouldn't be the first day that you try some of that stuff. Those are all things that you should be practicing. I always like to say race day should just be a long supported training day. So instead of a long bike ride where you have to stop and get your own Gatorade, where you have to stop and get your own gels, uh, where you have stop signs and stop lights, think of the race day. It's just a long training day with a lot of other people that you don't have to stop for any of that stuff. So you should have practiced your heart rate, your pacing, all your hydration, all your fueling, all that stuff is stuff that you should be carrying with you that you've practiced on all your long sessions day in and day out. Um, and like this says, purpose is to train your gut, train your gut, train, train your mind and everything so that you know what to expect with the hydration and the calories that you're taking in um, and the recovery drink. Uh, clean is phenomenal. Uh, I, I'm personally a chocolate for the clean guy with water, uh, but recovery drinks, again, sometimes like other things are overlooked. You know, everybody's like, I got the workout in and then boom, they get off their bike or done with a run and they're right on into life. You know, take the extra two minutes to focus on your recovery drink and get that stuff in. Uh, on race day, fueling may be the most important and it may be your most likely limiter on performance. Speaking personally, before I came on with QT2, this was my biggest limiter. Um, race day, a little bit of pacing that QT2 helped me dial in, but a lot of it was fueling and training. Like I said before, every workout I literally do that I'm gonna do on race day in terms of gels and hydration. And I, and I have it down. So my body and my mind, and it's, it's automatic. It, it, it's habit forming so that you're not thinking about how much you're drinking or the gels or when it's a habit. So now on race day, you're just focused on making sure you're staying in the right heart rate zone, make, make sure you're staying in the right power zones and focusing on the road in your competition rather than, am I eating enough? Am I drinking enough? You've already taken that limiter out of the equation. If you've practiced it day in and day out. Uh, final weeks, mental fitness. Um, again, something that I said earlier that I, I think is overlooked, reduce external pressure as best as you can. 
Um, you know, when you go to 70.3s or full Ironmans, you know, there's a lot of family that's going on. Uh, it's always nice to kind of have a lead person that can kind of lead the family or your friends around the course or what they're going to do. So they're not all asking you those questions. I, I think that's something that's uh, really helpful. Um, I know for me, it's my daughter. Um, she's the person everybody knows. Don't talk to me during race week, especially the last few days before race, because uh, I'm a little grumpy. Normally, I'm pretty easygoing. Uh, but I kind of get dialed in on focus and I'm trying to reduce my external pressures. So try to have somebody else that you trust uh, kind of take some things off of your plate. Uh, focus on what you can control, your attitude um, and your fueling. And that's one of the things that QT2 really, I think, does better than and most is control what you can control. You can't control the competition. You can't control the weather. Uh, but what you can't control is having a positive attitude, even if you're having a tough moment, okay? During any race, you're going to have ups and downs where you feel great and you feel terrible. It's a roller coaster. Know on the up, enjoy it. And on the way down, know if you're fueling right and you're pacing right, you're going to come back up again and you're going to, going to start racing to what you think your potential is and focus on your fueling, okay? You can control those things. Um, so make sure you're doing that. Trust your preparation, Again, going back to don't add in things that you don't need, workouts that you missed a week or two prior to your race. Trust the process. Preparation, I like to use the word process as well. Visualization. I actually did my master's on visualization. You know, it's really important to visualize, you know, walking to the starting line, you know, the feel of the water, the gun going off, walking in, the feel of people around you. And take your time with visualization. It shouldn't be rushed. It should almost be, actual time so don't you know you shouldn't be able to go through a swim the entire bike course and a run in 30 seconds to a minute it's not visualization take your time and realize all the things that could go wrong and all the things that you can do right to get yourself back on track if your goggles leak taking a hot moment and fixing them back up and even if it's in the middle of the swim okay you know a water bottle pops off because there are parts of the roads that are a little sketchy realizing there's you know you maybe have an extra or there's a water station Gatorade station coming on up. So relax if you're a little, some of those things. <clears throat> I, and then make sure for sure, is I have some people actually write down their whole pacing power plan on their bike. So they see it. Some people I have write it on their arms for the run. Know what your performance is going to look like. Know what your goals are, okay? For pacing and heart rate. Again, Time is hard to, to say because you don't know what the weather is going to be. Is it going to be hot? going to be cold? Is it going to be windy? So again, visualize all the different scenarios that are possible and likely and how you will respond. Like I said, if something goes wrong, breathe. It's a long day, okay? A 10 second or 20 second slowdown of anything is not going to blow up your entire race, okay? So take the time to correct it early on rather than let it lead to something worse down the road. So for instance, like, you know, pulling up your sock. You can feel it in the first half mile, the run kind of too low and you're starting to get a blister. Take 10 seconds in the first mile to get your sock up higher so you don't feel that, okay? List your goals and your targets, okay? 100% control over, all right? Targets, number-based, and internalize the race-specific workouts and how they feel, okay? Pre-race logistics, okay? Everyone should always review the athlete guide. I know uh, if it's your first time, you're reading through it four or five times, trying to get it all down, right? in the race details. If you're a veteran, eh, you know, whatever. And no, it's always important to kind of go through it again. You might miss something. Things might change. Um, new, and it's a new venue. So, you know, it's not like anybody's been here before at this race. So going through and reviewing the athlete guide and the race details are instrumental, especially for this new race, okay? Uh, the bike tune-up. I always like to say, again, 10, week, 10 days out, two weeks, I always like to make sure I get that in, especially, you know, all the cleaning of it and, you know, tires. Make sure that, you know, your tires are in good shape. If they're not new the re week of the race, that they're at least, a, you know, within a couple weeks to a month, you know, make sure you don't have a, lots of big dings or dents in your, in your wheels and they're, they got rips on them or, or holes. That's a big one, okay? Make sure your bike is, is tuned and ready to go. Uh, locally, there are some good bike shops, but if you're not local, just make sure that you get it done before you head out this way. Um, make your list of all your things you need to do. Purchase any need items, okay? So your bananas, your water, your unsweetened applesauce, your gels, any extra Gatorade, anything that you might need uh, fuel-wise, your pretzels, all that good stuff. Make sure you make a list. Make sure you get that ahead of time, okay? 
charge and replace batteries. <laughs> the more we get into the sport, the more things we have to charge, right? So you started early, normally you just had a watch. Now we're charging our die shifting. Now we're charging our power meters. Now we're charging, you know, our watches, all that stuff. Just make sure that you're, you're dialed in and everything's charged up and your batteries are changed. And if you don't change them, just make sure you have spare batteries. You know, the 2032s, I always have an extra few in my, in my transition bag, just in case something kind of goes wonky, you know, as I'm doing bike check-in or in the pre-morning check-in if it says battery low, okay? Pack everything, lay everything out, right? Like pre-race logistics. You know, I go to my swim. What do I have to put on in my swim? Goggles, swim cap, you know, all those things that you want to go through. Confirm res reservations. Definitely make sure you're doing that 10 to two weeks out. And then again, race week, okay? Plan on race check-in time Friday or Saturday. It's at the um, convention center, the Mass Mutual. Very easy to get to, plenty of parking, um, and it's in a, a good section of the city. So when you go down there, there's a few little restaurants there. There's plenty of parking. MGM is literally right across the street. Um, and actually the whole race, the, 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 the transition is right across the street um, from the check-in areas, okay? Uh, and here it is, Expo Athlete Check-In. It's Mass Mutual Center. It's right there on Main Street. There is a lot of parking there and on the side streets, um, but you'll see later in, there are some parking garages. Uh, there's at the MGM, there's a parking garage. There's two on Columbus Avenue that are easy to go to. And there is the Mass Mutual parking garage as well. I don't think in, all those will be full, uh, but there's one right at Mass Mutual and there is plenty of parking right around there. I don't think it'll be difficult to get in and out of there. Um, it's pretty straightforward down there. It's not a crazy city. If you haven't been to Springfield, um, it's on the smaller side of a city and where you're going with the Mass Mutual Center, it's on the edge of the city, right off of the highway. So it's not like you're driving into Boston or driving into you know, New York City or some other big place. It, it really is kind of an easy in, easy out to get to the Mass Mutual Center, okay? And you see the times, Friday 2 to 7 or Saturday 9 to 4. I'm an early get it out of the way type person, you know? So if you can get there Friday and get all your stuff, it, it allows you to just focus on Saturday doing your bike check-in and relaxing rather than one more thing to do on Saturday. But if you're traveling and you're only coming on Saturday, obviously um, that's what I would do. But if you live locally, I would definitely do it Friday. Um, or if you're here on Friday, get, get, get to town early enough so you can do it. Things you need to bring, bring your active.com registration, the QR code and a photo ID. Okay. Get to the expo early and limit your time there. You know, especially if you're a first time, it's, you know, it's a first time race. So there's going to be kind of new gear for what we're saying Western Mass. I know I'm, I'm a Western Mass guy. I grew up in the area. So it's uh, kind of exciting to me and a lot of other people that I've known that have been in the triathlons for a long, long time. Uh, so, but get in, get out again, stay off your feet, stay smart, stay hydrated. You know, if you want some gear, you can, you know, have other people get it for you, but try to really limit your time in and out of there. Race packet will include your race bib number to be worn on the run. Okay. You don't need it on the bike. Okay. The bike helmet sticker. So you're going to have a sticker for your helmet. You're going to have a sticker on your bike. Okay. You're gonna have your swim cap with your race number on it. Okay. And your bike checkout ticket for someone else if they're checking out your bike. So if you're new to it, you can check out your bike with your wristband. So don't make sure you don't take your wristband off if you're planning on getting your bike. Okay. Uh, but if you're not, and you're going to need some help or anything happens, you always give your ticket to somebody you trust. Remember that person that that race week that's going to be in charge of maybe any of your friends or family that are coming to watch you. That one trusted person that's going to limit your external stress. That's the person you give your, your bike checkout ticket to um, so they can get your bike out of transition at the end of the race. Uh, Pre-race briefing, Mass Mutual Center again, three to five or 12 to two. You know, if you're doing the check-in, again, it's a new race. Um, it's not a bad idea to hit the briefing, kind of get the little ins and outs of it. Uh, you know, I know there is a YouTube video, you know, out there of the bike course, somebody on their, you know, their GoPro, and you have this, and we're going to go over a lot of good deets of the course specifically. Um, but if you're new to 70.3, you're new to Ironman, um, pre-race briefings are, are excellent to go to. Uh, just kind of, you know, it's great gentle reminders for yourself. Okay. And then you have the mandatory bike check-in. Again, mandatory bike check-in and timing check pick, pick up. Okay. So you need to do those Saturday, 10 to 5. Okay. You can't show up race morning. You know, if you're used to a, a local try, 
you know, where you show up and you just do all your stuff on the morning before the race. It doesn't happen here. Okay. So it's very important that you do your mandatory bike check-in uh, and you schedule time to get in and out. Again, when you go and you put your bike in there, it's great to look around, you know, get some visual clues on where your bike's going to be when you're coming out of transition. Okay. Uh, coming out of the swim and how you're going to find it. But, you know, again, make sure that you're there for your mandatory bike check-in. Uh, the day before, nutrition, okay? Again, this is one of the things I think QT2, uh, again, pacing plan and, and nutrition is, you know, our core dietitians and, and what they set up for us uh, and our athletes. Um, to me, above and beyond, bar none, phenomenal compared to anything I've seen. They're, they're, they're great people. They're very professional and, and they do a great job. This large breakfast the day before the race consumed by 9 a.m. Uh, I think we actually have, a, a, this is actually, we have a QT2 breakfast that morning uh, that we can all go to. It lists there the carbohydrates, the proteins. Uh, and then after breakfast, you're looking to taper throughout the course of the day. Um, and so what, what you're really looking to do is your, your, your digestive system and your GI issues and limiting problems the next day with GI and, and bathroom breaks, okay? Uh, so if you get that large breakfast in, and again, you're tapering, so you're using less calories, you're not exercising as much, so you're not, you don't want to put on that extra weight. It's a great job right here with this large breakfast. You hydrate. Um, again, whether it be whatever you're going to hydrate, make sure you stay on top of it. It's really good to kind of keep track of it rather than just kind of guess like, oh, I, I think I drank this. You know, have a water bottle, know how many times you're going to fill it. And <clears throat> so you're better off going over a little a little overhydrated than underhydrated. We don't want to overhydrate. That's bad. But a little over is better than uh, than under. Uh, avoid caffeine. Uh, and like I said, legs up, rest and relax uh, as much as you can the day before as after the mandatory bike check-in. Uh, final checks. The short shakeout, you know, your run, your bike, your swim. Uh, everybody has their own little different routine based off of coaches uh, and things. Um, but again, you're not proving anything the day before the race of the week, the race week. Okay. So, you know, you're not going to go out there for a short swim, bike and run and go hit all your, you know, your personal best in those. Okay. Those are just shakeouts. Those are just loosen up the body, calm the nerves. You know, again, I always like to think of the swim. The last swim is my goggles don't leak, get in the water, get some feel the bike, make sure everything's shifting great. Make sure all my power meter, everything's charged up, ready to go. Everything's connected. And the run is just to connect and just, you know, make sure I use the elastic tie shoes. So just make sure that they feel good. They're not too tight or they're not too loose. Okay. Setting out your gear for race morning. Okay. Your tri kit, your swim cap, your wetsuit, you know, again, I like to do it in order. Okay. Before you set up. So everything in a swim, everything in a bike, all that your run stuff. And I like to sit there and visualize myself. Okay. Race morning, I'm going to put on my, my race gear. Right. And then, all right, well, I got my timing chip. Don't ever forget that. All right, then I'm going to put on my wetsuit, got my goggles, got my swim cap, got my watch, okay? And then you kind of go through, okay, I got to rip off my wetsuit, goggles, cap, they go here, you know, socks, if you use socks, I use socks on the bike, socks, shoes, biking shoes, helmet, sunglasses, all your nutrition too. I like to lay that out just so I know what it's going to be there when I get on the bike, all my gels, maybe my power bars, a couple, I start off with my own water bottles, okay? Good, then you go to your run. Maybe it's a cap, maybe it's a visor, maybe it's not, okay? Your bib, your race bib, your running shoes, maybe gels if you're carrying your own gels because you, you haven't practiced with the course gels, okay? All those things, lay them all out perfectly for your pre-race clothing, um, everything. So the pre-race clothing I want to go over, we're going to go over during the swim, but there is a, a little walk from transition to the swim. So you're going to want some shoes that you can kind of leave behind, whether you have family or friends that go up there and you can hand them to them, or you're just going to leave them behind and they get donated to a local shelter. Um, Pre-race clothing should include things that keep you warm, okay, in case it's a cool morning, along with some foot gear uh, to walk up to the swim start. It's, it's a smooth, easy path. It's part of the run path that you're going to walk, but uh, please be aware that you will be walking a mile to the, uh, to the swim start. Uh, and your after race clothing, I think people overlook this. Um, even if it's a hot day, a lot of times after a hard race, you know, you you get, you, you do get the chills. Okay. Especially, you know, on a half, you'll be finishing in the midday, you know, full Ironman, sometimes you finish at night and you get the chills, but make sure you have some clean clothes to put on some sweatpants, a sweatshirt or some shorts, 
and some comfortable shoes and or sandals. I'm I'm a I'm a clogs. I'm a Birkenstock clog guy, but uh, everybody should have their own thing, you know, because you just uh, had your bike shoes on, you had your run shoes on, you may have blisters or just your feet just don't feel like going in tight shoes. So have something that's a little comfortable for your feet. Okay, afterwards, uh, race morning and after race nutrition. So again, at the end, I always, you know, your recovery drink. You just did an incredible workout. Don't skip that recovery drink after the race. I know you you might be tempted to. But that's just going to start your recovery for your for your next segment, your next race, your next training cycle. So again, please make sure that you're, you know, after the race, you're 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 hitting your nutrition as well in terms of hydration and a recovery drink. Uh, confirming race morning logistics, finalized plans for getting to the starting line. Okay, uh, whether it's you're driving yourself there, and we're going to talk talk later on about parking, um, or you're having somebody drive you there and you're getting dropped off. Um, always give yourself extra time um, so you don't feel rushed and you don't feel that extra little stress in the morning. You know, it's better to have, you know, 20 minutes that you kind of have to sit around at the start rather than you're literally jogging to the start um, and your heart rate's jacked and your anxiety's there. So way, way, you know, kind of figure out, you know, how far you are away and then add about 20% time in terms of, you know, cause you remember there's going to be a lot of people trying to flow in at the same time as you so if you're like, all right, it takes me 20 minutes and I want to be there for, for four, I should leave at 340, you know, leave it, you know, 320 in the morning I'm using random numbers, obviously. Um, give yourself a little bit more leeway to get there so you can just breathe and relax. And if anything isn't quite right, you have time to correct it and still get to the starting line, relaxed and less stress. Uh, early to bed, set multiple alarms. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't, I mean, I set multiple alarms, but <laughs> generally my alarms never go off because, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm anxious. I'm, I'm excited uh, for the day, um, but definitely try to get into bed early so you can at least get some sleep before you're kind of up with your eyes awake. So race, morning, nutrition, breakfast, simple carbs, fluids, electrolytes, small amount of protein. Uh, you know, QT2 has this wonderful formula that we go into a lot. It's fantastic. Highly recommend it for those who don't use it. Um, but important to have those simple carbs, your fluid and electrolytes a few hours before the start of the race. No fat, fiber, extra vitamins or minerals. Okay. That's all for your GI, your stomach issues. So you don't have any stomach issues on the bike or the run or any time during the race. Okay. The core diet recommends the, the breakfast. Here it is. It's the applesauce, the banana, the scoop away, and the sports drink. I'm telling you right now, I wouldn't try it on race morning for the first time. Um, but I, I mean, I do this every Saturday before my long rides, uh, just so I'm used to it. Uh, and it works and it's fantastic. And I, I highly recommend it. Okay. Um, sip on the sports drink until the race start. Keep sipping on it. And if you're hungry, eat a little bit. You know, like you have a gel 15 to 20 minutes prior to the race start. You know, it's not in here. But, you know, if, you know, 40 minutes before you're a little hungry, you know, you know, maybe you have a little part of, you know, a little, a half of a gel before that, you know, just make sure that you go into the start of the swim, hydrated and fueled. Um, again, control things that you can control. Okay. Race morning logistics. Here we go. Parking and transportation. Parking at transistor. So the riverfront park, uh, it, it's a pretty good size parking area. You have, um, it's where the basketball hall of fame is. And then you have a cannabis plant there and you have the hotel, the Hilton hotel there. It's a pretty big size parking lot uh, for all the athletes uh, to kind of get in there and park. There shouldn't be an issue. However, you never know. Again, it's the first time the race is happening here. So there's going to be a lot of different, you know, moving parts that maybe haven't been foreseen. So if you get there and Riverfront Park is closed, it's all booked up with all, all parking relax. The MGM is right across the street. You'll be able to walk there. No problem. Very quickly. Not a big deal. Okay. And then actually down by the swim start, um, it, it's, it's probably about less than a half mile away. So again, not a long walk. Okay. No more than maybe you want to, but there's uh, the Columbus Avenue parking garages. There's two, there's uh, 91 North and 91 South parking garages down that way. Um, and there's actually a lot of street parking. Uh, on the side streets and mass mutual center parking garage as well so there is ample parking within a reasonable distance to where transition is uh, for the athletes and for the spectators okay uh, and and nice part is kind of easy in easy out so spectators coming in late 
or wanting to leave during certain, maybe certain parts of the race. Um, it's not like some races where you kind of can get locked in and the roads will be closed down. You're heading out in the complete opposite direction for the race. So when you're parked in these areas, you'll actually be able to kind of come and go um, without much of an issue. Okay. So no parking or shuttle service to swim start like we talked about earlier. It's going to be a short walk. So make sure you bring something to wear on your feet to walk up to the swim start and either plan on donating them. Uh, and I'm sure they will take them to the local shelters and or have a family member that or friend uh, that's going to take them with you. Or if you're really ambitious, uh, go back and get them later in the day. Uh, allow time to walk to the swim start. Okay. You know, I would say give yourself 20 minutes. You know, that way you can get down there. You don't feel rushed. You can sit, you can breathe, you can relax before you're, you self-seed yourself, okay? Transition opens 4.30, okay, to 6. Uh, you know, like I said, whatever time you plan on being there, um, you know, give yourself a little leeway knowing that uh, you also have a walk to the swim start, okay? Check bike, drop off all your bike and run gear. Um, again, you go to your bike, put your you know, your uh, computer on it, put your hydration on it for the morning, you know, your gels in it, you know, if you didn't leave it the day before, you know, check your run gear, lay everything out so that you're perfectly ready to go. And then just sit there for a second, I, you know, visualize it coming out of the water, look at where your bike is, what row are you in? Maybe there's a tree nearby, maybe there's, you know, whatever it happens to be, give yourself a landmark because, you know, you just swam for a half hour. Now you're running down the thing, you're a little disoriented, maybe, you know, you're a little amped up, you're nervous. Um, you know, so give yourself some good visualizations uh, as you're running into um, that area, okay? Um, and drop off post-race bags, not mentioned in the athlete guide. Not quite sure how the, the post-race bags are happening um, or if they think because all the parking is right there, maybe you're just leaving it in your vehicle, okay? Uh, that might also be something. And make sure you're applying sunscreen, okay? You know, if you get sunburnt out there, your body doesn't sweat as as easily and it's not as good and therefore you're not cooling your body therefore your race can be affected okay uh general overview well, let's kind of go with over the swim the the one-way downstream river swim uh there's been a lot on the forum about the quality of the water i just kind of i want to start there before we go anywhere else um, i've swam in it i know people swim in it know the fish that's in there I know there was just a report that there was a bunch of stuff dumped in there. It's flowing water. It's it's going to be fine. And Ironman's pretty good about making sure that we swim and water that is um, up to human standards. Okay. So that's one thing I did want to quickly address um, for that. Um, and again, with the swim, you're going to walk. You got to walk that 1.2 1, 1. miles up to swim down the river. Now, um, the swim for itself, um, it, there's a little current, but it's not crazy. Okay. Um, so don't think like if say you're a 40 minute swimmer here, here we go. Race day swim course overview. Um, it's a 6am swim start. Okay. Uh, down river self seed. Here we go. Water temps. Um, right now I live in the area. It's going to be in the, it's definitely going to be in the, the mid to upper sixties. Uh, it's going to be perfect for wetsuit swimming. Um, have a plan though, in case it's not, but I, I honestly, I would struggle to imagine that it won't be wetsuit legal. Okay. Um, I, I just can't see it ever getting up to 76.1, even with that little bit of heat wave coming for the next couple of weeks, it is moving water coming from the North, which is a little cooler down the, down the river. We should be fine. Um, but like I said, so if you're 40, say you're planning on swimming 40 minutes, you swim typically 40 minutes for an Ironman with no current you know, you're going to be a minute or two faster, but you're not going to be 10 minutes faster. Okay. So kind of think about that as you're self-seeding yourself. Um, there is a little bit of current, but it's not like they're going to have, you know, catchers out in the middle of the river so that you're, you know, if you miss the catchers, you, you know, you're going to float on by the, the, um, the exit area. Um, so just be prepared. You will have a little bit faster swim, but it's not going to be astronomically faster, but it will be nice to spend a, a little less time in the water. I mean, for the non-swimmers like myself, I always like the shorter swims that are downstream. Okay. The sun will be off to your left where all the transition is and where the city are, um, the buoys. So they have the first half, uh, yellow, uh, orange buoys, second half are red and the turn buoys. Uh, it's really what you want to do is as you're swimming downstream and as you're sighting, you have to realize that you're going to go, you're coming to one bridge. And as you're getting closer to that bridge, you're going to see the last red buoy. 
and that's where you're going to have to turn left. Literally, as you go underneath the one bridge that you swim under, you're going to start at one bridge, just, just below one bridge, and you're swimming underneath the second bridge, and that's when you're going to exit, okay? So it's a great landmark uh, as you're swimming. You know, if you're looking up, you're going to see this massive bridge crossing the river, so you can gauge how much further you are, realizing that after you go under that bridge, there's going to be a red buoy where you're going to bang a bang a left, and it, you know it's not a sharp, it's not a 90 degree angle over there. You know it's a nice left hand turn right over to the swim exit. There, um, it's a long run to transition. I, I wouldn't say it's crazy. You know, I, you know every Ironman, every place has their own different thing. Um, it should be relatively fine for everybody. Everybody's going to do a great job there as well. But with the swim, the walk up, get out into that river. Enjoy it down there using that bridge as your point, knowing, all right, when I get underneath that bridge, the red buoy's coming up, bang that left and get into transition. Um, I kind of went over this, the self-seating rolling start. Be realistic about your swim start. And that's kind of why I went over, um, you know, the, the current and the water. You know, everybody's going to play the current a little bit differently. Um, me personally, uh, my athletes, I'd rather have to swim out and around somebody a little bit or catch somebody's feet and, and feel that rather than me going out at a little self seeing myself a little faster and having people swim over me. Um, there's nothing more panicky that, to me than when somebody's touching your feet, grabbing your leg and, and you're too slow and you can't go anywhere and they're swimming up on you and or over you. So just be realistic um, and, and self seed yourself. You know, I'd rather, you know, say it's 40 minutes and you go in at the 38 minute group and then, you know, you come out and it's 37. That's a nice surprise rather than you're like, oh, I normally swim 40, but with the current, you know, I'm going in with a 35 minute group and then you come out and it's 37. So the exact same time, but in your mind, it's a little bit different mindset. You're like, oh, I'm two minutes slower than I thought I'd be rather than the other. If you self you see yourself with the 38 minute pace group, right in that kind of area and you get out a little faster, you're like, all right, I feel good. I'm having a good day. I'm having a good race. Okay, that sets your mindset and your body and your attitude for the bike. It sets yourself up for a positive start to the bike and the rest of your day rather than a negative mindset. So I always like that, like to say that as well as we get into here. Um, the first 20, 30 meters can be a little tempo, kind of get out into the middle there and, and bang a left to get out there. Uh, then you kind of settle in, you know, after the first, you know, four or 500 yards, most people are pretty much, you know, settled in. There'll be a little clamor here and there, but with the current, I think it's going to keep everybody a little bit more honest in terms of not as much um, changing of swimming. Um, use other swimmers to your benefit. Get on somebody's feet. If you can swim out and you go by them easy, go. Go by them. Catch to the next feet. If you get out from somebody's feet and you got to really work hard and you're only just past their knees or half body, that means that person's saving you time and energy. Drop back behind those. Use that draft. Use those feet. Uh, and enjoy the swim, realizing that you're conserving energy for later in the day on the bike and the run, okay? If you go by them fast, that means that person's swimming too slow and you're good to go. But if you have to work really hard to get by them, settle back in, relax, enjoy the swim, get out, and then get ready for the bike and the run. Um, the buoys, the course markers, the turn buoys, uh, you can swim on either side, except for the ones where you have to turn at, okay? Keep the turn buoys on your left, okay? So when you get into the water, there's going to be one where you have to turn left to go downstream, where you have to swim out to the river, turn left. And then again, you have the bridge right underneath after that bridge. There's going to be a red one. You're going to have to bang another left. Make sure you're outside of that one. Make sure it's on your left hand side, okay, as you go around it. All right. Um, and turns can be crowded. So I always like to say, stay wide. You know, be five, 10, 15 is a little on the extreme, but I like to be about 10 yards wide on that because then people come in and they all get all cramped up and then everybody half starts treading water i'd rather see you breathe swim an extra three or four or five yards okay and your anxiety stays down and your heart rate stays down and you're not panicking uh and your time may be faster or even if it's the same you've reduced your anxiety and your stress level and your heart rate levels by not getting mixed in on that tight corner with all the other people that are maybe throwing elbows or kicking, you know, again, not on purpose, but it just happens as everybody trying not to drown. Okay. So just make sure you stay out there. So the bike preview, here we go on the bike. It is, believe it or not, 90% of it's great. Um, it's kind of whining, goes a little bit into Connecticut. It's out into a bunch of the surrounding towns. Um, I've driven it and I've ridden it. Okay. So, so speaking from personal experience, um, 
you know, you're going to get out of transition and the first mile, you know, you just settle in, you know, you just got out of the water, get your bike legs here. You know, here it is. It's a single loop. It's rolling. Um, you, you got some patches of rough pavement, but that first mile, you're going to go down, you're going to go up into the highway, you're crossing over a bridge. So it's, it's not terrible, but you got those, you know, segments for the expansion that can be a little rickety. It's about a mile to about a mile and a half. You get off that bridge and you loop around to river road. And that's where I would tell you, that's when you get out kind of more into your arrow and you kind of start the race. Okay. Spend that first mile, get in some of that hydration, because remember, you know, you haven't been drinking for, you know, over half hour, probably you get into transition. You're amped up, you know, get on that bike, let those, let the heart rate settle get some hydration in, maybe get a gel in you or something. Okay. Get over that bridge, get around that, the first part of the rotary and you're going to hit river road. And it's a great, it's a great couple mile stretch. It's a gradual uphill. It's a little false flat uphill. It's a great road. Okay. And as you get to the end of that, um, you're going to take a quick left and a quick right. And when you do that, um, quick left and quick right, you're going to start going up uh, South street. Okay. And this is where it kind of starts going uphill. And this South Street is, it's not terrible, um, but it's not great. It's a little bumpy. And that's the one thing I want to tell you about this course is, you know, the rough patches are rough, okay? And there's, you're going to be jostled a little bit, but they're short, okay? You know, there's a lot of talk out there that they're terrible, big potholes. And potholes have been taken care of, okay? But some of the patchy stuff is still there. Realizing the patchy parts are, you know, anywhere from 100 to 400 yards long, and then you're right back into that nice smooth section. So just realize as you get into that patchy section, you know, be careful, you know, avoid it, be smart, you know, try not to be swerving though all over the place. You know, you have to be safe for yourself so you don't fall. But, you know, if somebody's coming up on your left, you know, be, be careful that you're not swerving too much to crash with somebody that you don't see. And also if you're going to pass somebody, Common courtesy on your left, you know, let people know, especially in these rougher patchy sections where people might be moving left or right to avoid some of the bigger bumps. Okay. So as you go up, up the hill, um, like I said, it's a little, eh, and then you're going to kind of, you, you go, you cross over another road, you kind of go up a little bit more. And then that road really starts to get really nice and you kind of bang a left and then, and, and you get out into this really, really beautiful section. You go through some golf courses. Um, and you go through some pasture areas and it's rolling at that point, little up, little down, little up, little down. Um, the biggest things I really want to focus on uh, are coming up now. So when you get to Kongamon, you're going to take a right on to Kongamon. It's a nice little gradual uphill. You're going to do downhill and you're going to see it's a big major intersection. There's a big Y there, whether you notice it or not. Um, but as you cross it, you're going to get into Vining Hill Road. And as you get onto this road, it's a short, steep uphill. Uh, not crazy. Uh, but you know, you're going to have to use your easy gear, you know, spin it out. Don't, you know, don't hammer it up realizing, you, you know, it's a short one. You're going to get up to the top and then you've got a little descent. Um, you might be able to get into arrow for just a little bit, but this is the one with a sharp right hand turn. Okay. At the bottom of this, you're taking, um, a short right hand turn, uh, where you just, you, you can't be in your arrow bars. Okay. It's a steep, steep downhill to a hard right. Okay, so, you know, really be careful as you're taking that right uh, out there. And then you have, once you take that hard right, get right into your arrows. Okay, as soon as you get to that bottom of that, sorry, and then it's a beautiful rollers. Okay, you got this nice rolling section to take a left on the Highway 57. Okay, and the roads are pretty good there. When you take that left on the Highway 57, you got about a half mile and you're going to hit the, then you hit the hill. So if you look at the profile, that hill, okay, the profile, I, I'm not, Superly, I don't think it really dictates it or really resonates what the course really feels like at highway 57. Okay. Um, somewhere around mile 32. Uh, I, I wasn't, I didn't go and look exactly. It's a long, gradual hill. It's a great hill. Okay. Wide shoulder and it kind of swerves up and around. You know, this is where you know, you're going to, you know, obviously power, heart rate are going to go up a little bit, but don't spike it, you know, because there's, there's a lot of course left where you can still attack on some rollers and some flat. So, but this hill is a great, long, steady climb. Uh, it's not going to kill you uh, if you're used to hills. Um, but if you're smart and you hydrate and you 
don't overdo it on this hill. You're going to have an opportunity uh, at the top when you turn on the Westfield Street to really kind of start attacking it even more. Okay. So after that long roller, you're going to take it right at the top. Again, once you take it right at the top, it's a great uh, arrow bar section of some rollers with some kind of steep uphills. Uh, so really use the rollers to your advantage um, a lot. Use it really to your advantage. And there's one little left-hand turn, but you're going to see it coming. It's all, it's all, it actually, the next two turns I'm going to talk about, you're going to see them. They're on downhills, but they're a nice gradual downhill and they're going to have people there and you're going to see them. So once you're on this old Westfield road, which turns the Granville road, you're going to take a left. And then you're on that road for a little while. And again, I'm trying not to be too specific, but these are the important parts of the, of the race course that I do want you to be aware of. Um, Hillside road. So when you get to Hillside road, Okay, you're going to be out there, you know, 40 miles or so. Um, it starts off really patchy for the, like I talked about that few hundred yards, and then it turns into this beautiful pavement. Get into those arrow bars. It's a nice roller downhill, and then you get a good little steep section of downhill. Stay in the arrows. Okay, if you can, you're, you're not going to go so fast that you're going to be nervous unless you're not a great bike handler. And then it kind of, kind of flattens out a little bit with a downhill, but this is where there's a sharp, sharp right hand turn again. Um, it, but it's, it's totally manageable. It's not like the other one after Vining Hill, where literally you're going to have to break to take a, a 90 degree right at the bottom of a steep hill. This one you're going to see coming. There's a beautiful golf course on your right. You're coming down, slowly coming through, and you're going to see it, but it is a switchback. Okay. So realize that. Just don't goose it. As you see that corner coming, you don't, don't put power to the pedals. You know, enjoy that last little bit of the downhill, letting your legs kind of recover. Because as you take that switchback back to the right, you have a couple little rollers up as you go by the golf course and you're going to end up um, over on Tanner Hill Road, okay? Which is, again, this course is rollers. So use the rolling to your advantage, okay? You have those two major turns that I just talked about, the one on, at the bottom of Vining and this one, Hillside on the sunny side, okay? Those two, um, just be very careful. Everything else, use the, use the rollers to your advantage, okay? So... I always like to say you crest the top third and you start going on the bottom third, okay, of these hills. And that allows you to really get going up the bottom of the next hill. Use your momentum to carry yourself through that next hill, especially on a 56, you, you know, 56 miles, you know, really use the momentum to get over those hills. And if you do that, especially in these small little sections here, uh, you're going to gain some astronomical time on competition. Just make sure you're in the right gear. Like I said, pedal the, the top third down after you crest pedal the bottom third, getting ready for to climb the next part, and you're going to be solid and ready to go. Now, they've changed the end of this course <laughs> two to three times. And the reason being is um, the roads were really terrible. So as you as you get through Tanner, you're going to get on a Shaker road, and you're into Westfield. You're, you, and at that point, after you get off a of Shaker, they put you on a made road, and it's a major road. Um, that you're going to be on for a couple miles. And then they're going to dip you in and out of a couple neighborhoods. Uh, they were going to throw you onto what's called Memorial uh, Avenue, uh, which is, it's gravel bike worthy. Uh, that road is that rough, uh, but they've eliminated some of it. Um, that's the only section that I would say, you know, you really, once you get to Memorial, unless they do something different or they pop us out a little further down, um, that road can be, is a little on the rough side, but it's right at the end. Okay. Um, but the bike course is very fair, very reasonable. Um, and as much as people talk about how terrible it is, the rough sections, be patient, okay? But the good sections, race them and race them good and race them hard. You know, think of those rough sections as a mild recovery, okay? Because they're not that long, okay? You think of it as an opportunity to either get a drink of water or let your legs settle back in for your next effort, okay? Uh, race day fueling. You have your aid stations, okay? About every 15 miles, pretty standard at Ironman, okay? You have your bottle exchange. So again, you know what the bottle exchange, if you're new or something, you know, remember, have your arm out and you give as the water bottles are holding the water bottles. You got to give a little bit, okay? You know, and slow down a little bit. Don't go 25 miles an hour through there because it's going to ricochet off your hand. It's going to hit somebody. And also be, you know, a little caught, you know, be aware of your surroundings. There are some people that just don't care, and you have to recognize those people. If you're racing next to them, they're just thinking about themselves. You know, be courteous during those sections. Get yourself, slow down. I like to make sure as I know it's coming, I see it's coming. I'm finishing, topping off whatever I have left. 
tossing it. So I'm getting new ones um, in the bottle exchange. So again, it's like, you know, catching anything. You got to give as that water bottle comes into your hand or the Gatorade, you know, put it in your, you know, your cage. If it's the water, hot day, over the top, back of your head, get your, your, your body, cool that body down. You know, we're really big on keeping your body temperature cool down. If you can keep your body cool and use those water bottles on the bike, uh, to keep your body down, then you can push your heart rate. You know, the cooler your body temperature is, the, the more you can push your heart rate, the lower your heart rate stays, the better your performance is going to be. Uh, there'll be Martin gels out there, bananas, um, carry your own. Uh, you know, some people like to use the stuff. They think of it as, you know, using it. It's there for you to use. Uh, but a lot of times, especially the gels and other things, if you can carry them, they're your own personal stuff. You can take them when you need them. Timing wise, not waiting for that. So race day fueling, the Martin gels, just know the black, have no ca caffeine. The white have caffeine. They're a little lower in sodium and they're very, very high in caffeine. So if you've never done them before, uh, you know, just be careful with the caffeine for GI issues um, and make sure, you know, you're getting enough sodium in other ways. Okay. Uh, the bike pacing. Um, so the race, thank you. Right. The, the bike pacing, heart rate, U shaped. Okay. Second half, two to three beats higher than your first half. Like I just kind of talked about going over the bridge, start steady. You want to start easy, finish strong. You know, and the U shape is you start easy and you work your way. And then those last few miles, it's actually kind of, I didn't say it during that. It's actually kind of perfect that there's kind of the tosses and turns and the roads are bad. Think of it as you're just letting your legs recover and get ready for the run. Okay. You know, we talked about taking the last mile or two anyways on the bike to finish off your hydration, finish your nutrition and let your legs kind of spin out and get ready for the run. The road conditions are, are almost going to do that naturally for us. Uh, so rather than think, think of it as a hindrance, just think of it as our natural little bit of recovery at the end of the bike to get ready for that run. So don't think of it as a negative. Turn that negative into a positive, and you'll be better off for it, okay? Drafting violations, okay? Blue card, you know, again, read, read through the, the athlete guide. Know what your drafting violations are. Know that you have your, you know, know how many bike lengths you have to stay behind. You know, six bike lengths between front wheel and the rear wheel. Okay, very important. You, you know, you know, as you come up and you pass people, you know, it's always courtesy to do this, but you don't, you don't want to get a drafting penalty. You know, it's cheating. You know, so you know, you might get stuck. You might get, you know, I've seen people get jammed up when they weren't drafting. They were actually the innocent person. You know, but be conscious of this. You know, you know, do your best. You know, to be a, a great athlete and a great competitor and keep it fair and equal for everybody. Pass on your left, and if you have enough breath, especially during those bumpy sections, like I said. Make sure that you say, hey, on your left, it does help, okay? Blocking violation, yellow card, again, pulling up and blocking people off. You know, if you're going to pass, you get 25 seconds. Get by them, get in front of them, and just realize if somebody passes you, it's your responsibility to drop back that six bike flanks, not for them to go six bike flanks in front of you, okay? And littering, make sure we're only using where we throw our gel wrappers or our water bottles at the aid stations, okay? Not anywhere along the course, Okay. Western Mass is a beautiful community. Let's keep it beautiful, okay, during the race as well. Uh, the run course, uh, very flat, even power on the bike. Like, you're going to get off the bike. You're going to literally run right back to where you swam from. So the where you walk in the point to the swim, beginning of the swim, you're going to run that same mile up there. You're going to get to the bridge. You're going to bang left over the bridge. It's not a steep uphill to the bridge. You know, sometimes you get to overpasses, and it's like this super steep up and over. It's really not. Um, it's pretty steady. It's pretty equal. You're going to go over. you got a nice little common area that you're going to run through, run back over the bridge, you know, along the river is beautiful down, go to U-turn. You're going to go right back to transition. You're going to do that same loop again. You're going to go back down, do the U-turn. And the second time through you bang it right. And they're going to zigzag you to a finish line, um, over on hall of fame app. Okay. The bike, the run course, excuse me, it's along the river. It's going to be cooler. You're going to be great. Aid stations about every mile. You got water, Gatorade. You got some Red Bull, you got gels, chips, uh, bananas, oranges, you know, it, again, you should have practiced all this. This should all be standard for what you're going to do, whether you, you know, you put a little water over your head, sip Gatorade, how often you're going to take your gels, all that stuff, you know, make sure that you've been practicing so that on race day, it's just habit forming. You're focused on your heart rate and your pacing and staying cool so that you can push your pace. Um, heart rate bike heart rate, you're going to be up five to 10 beats from, from your bike heart rate. Okay. Um, again, take that first mile says it down below, take it easy. Okay. You should take a couple easy miles at the end of the bike. 
you got to get those run legs. Okay. Um, personally, it, it, the best two runs I've ever had in a 70.3, I, I wanted to quit after mile one. I ran my first, you know, we run the first mile, your legs feel like lead and you're like, oh my God, I'm just going to run slower. If you plan on running, let's just say a 10 minute pace, say that's your goal pace for the race, you know, your first mile should be slower. You want a negative split. If you, you don't say, I, I want to run 10 minute pace. And then your first mile, you're like, oh man, I, I got to get in. Cause I'm going to be tired at the end. I'm going to run my first one at nine minutes or nine 30. No, take the first mile, like the lactic acid out, let your, get your run legs back, get your breathing in, let your heart rate settle. Take that first mile and relax and settle into your heart rate, settle into your pacing plan and enjoy that you're moving and that you're in a really awesome race. Okay. Um, race day, mental fitness. Okay. Focus on your goals is number one priority. Items that you have 100% control over, we've gone over it over and over again. Your attitude. Remember, taking negatives and turning them into positives. I mentioned it three or four times during the course of this. Fueling plan. Again, habit forming. Make sure you're eating what you're supposed to eat, when you're supposed to be eating, drinking what you're supposed to drink, how much you're supposed to be drinking. It's all, it's stay on task with that. Control what you can control, and the rest of it will take care of itself. You only have to worry about your pacing and your heart rate. Focus on your targets. Power, pace, heart rate. Don't panic if you're not exactly where you think you should be when you should be there, okay? Especially early in the bike, early in the run. Be patient, okay? Start easy, finish strong. Don't go out too hard. It'll backfire on you in the long run, okay? Stick to the plan. Whatever plan you have, try to stick to it the best that you can. Obviously, during race, things come up and, and it, you know, things might happen that you have to alter the plan. Okay, that's the visualization. Go through all those things pre-race so that you know what you're going to do if anything happens in the race. But stick to the plan as often as best as you can. Okay, outcome should be left to the second half of the run, if at all. Okay, place, time, world shot. Like, listen, you can't be thinking about that until the last six miles. And if you got things left, then just go for it, right? But up until then, pace, heart rate, plan, pace, heart rate, fueling, pace, heart rate, fueling, fuel, fuel, fuel. Control what you can control. And the outcome will take care of itself. Don't get caught up per se. You know, you don't know if it's going to be rainy, if it's going to be windy. You don't know what the other athletes are doing. Focus on yourself. Focus on your journey and the outcome will happen the way it should. Okay. Be who you are. Okay. And the last thing I'll add in here that's not in here, you know, know your why. Uh, I did a, I did a YouTube on it. Know your why. Why are you out there? There's going to be struggles during that day. Know your why. Why are you there? What are you trying to do? You know, during the dark times, what's going to bring you? I like to have my athletes write a little motivational speech. I have my kids write a little quote of my arm before a race. Kind of helps you when you're out there, just kind of refocus during some of the dark times. Okay. Swim, you got an hour and 10 to complete the swim. If not, then unfortunately you can't go onto the bike. The bike, 5.30 to complete the, complete the swim, T1 and bike. Okay. The cutoff, you must reach mile 32 by 10.40 a.m. Okay. Otherwise, unfortunately, uh, you won't be transitioning to the run. And, um, <laughs> that's important. Uh, and 8.30 to complete the swim, T1, bike, T2, and run. The cutoff must start the second loop of the run by 150. Okay, those are important to recognize. Um, and if you're going to be close, push, push. Don't be happy that you're not going to be able to do it. Push to get there to make that cutoff because you never know what's going to happen. You know, the journey is getting to the finish line. Sometimes the greatest experience is the struggle and being like, you know what, I could have quit, but I didn't. And I made it to the finish line. It wasn't my best, but you know what? I didn't give up on myself and all the people that are there going to be following you and tracking you and cheering you on at the end. Uh, full Ironmans, I've never missed a midnight finish. Uh, I, I think those people are phenomenal. So don't think if you were just making the cutoff, you're any less of an athlete that finished the race number one. Uh, it's just an amazing accomplishment to do 70.3 miles in a short amount of time. And not a lot of people can do it. So pat yourself on the back and make sure that you have pride in doing it, okay? Race day spectators, athlete tracking, there's an app, actually pretty good. It's gotten so much better as years gone on. They do a really good job with the athlete tracker for the most part. Uh, Pre-agreed locations along the course. It's a little tough one, to be honest with you. I mean, once you watch the people get on the swim, you go to transition, you see them get on the bike, it's a big one looper out there. It's kind of hard unless you really know the area and you can hop in your car and go find somebody on the bike and then fly back in to watch the run. So if you're not aware of the area that's you, you know you 
the run is going to be where you watch everybody because you get to go them out on the run. They're going to come back. They're going to go back out. They're going to come back. You're going to get to watch them four or five times in the run. That's really where a lot of the spectating is going to happen on this, unless you are unless you really know the area and you hop in a car or a motorcycle and you go watch some of your friends at other free, free range locations, okay? And then the finish line meetup, okay? So important when somebody finishes to have somebody there to help them with all their stuff and walk back or just cheer them on. So again, make sure you know where you're going to meet people and how you're going to meet them. Uh, at the end of the race, uh, have that meetup location, okay? Um, and there's no questions because we're not live right now. I do appreciate everybody's time uh, and go QT2.